Alright, this is the Dermatology Pathophysiology from Module 1. These are the objectives that we will be answering throughout this lecture. Okay, so our first topic is psoriasis, which is distinguished by sharply marginated erythematous silvery scaly plaques. Uh, this can be described as a common chronic persistent or relapsing skin condition. And our topic is going to cover the uh, genetic and the environmental causes of this both the patient's genetics and their environment play a role in psoriasis. Genetic factors tend to increase a person's susceptibility. Scientists have discovered 25 trigger genes or genetic variants that can increase the likelihood of developing psoriasis. A couple of these are CARD14, which is associated with plaque psoriasis, and IL36RN, which tends to be associated with three types of pustular psoriasis. Uh, the IL36RN um, genetic variation tends to cause a mutation that increases the amount of interleukin 1 produced um, by preventing the production of a cytokine suppressing gene. Uh, there's also a strong association to human leukocyte antigen 1, MHC. Um, Overexpressions of genes that code for class 1 MHC in these people often cause a increased susceptibility for psoriasis outbreaks. Uh, sometimes these can be asymptomatic, but they can be triggered by environmental factors. Um, it's very also likely also in relatives uh, of affected individuals and has a high rate of heritability in monozygotic identical twins. So environmental factors tend to trigger psoriasis uh, to become symptomatic in individuals who are genetically predisposed. Some of these can include physical injury or Kevnerization, Kevner's phenomenon, you can call it any of those things really. Uh, and this is the development of a psoriatic uh, outbreak in response to an abrasion cut tattoo or hematoma. Deep Kevner phenomenon is also strongly associated with psoriatic arth arthritis. Um, stress can also cause psoriatic outbreaks. These can be primary outbreaks or it can actually aggravate an existing outbreak. Also, anything that affects the immune system, any kind of infection. Some of the most associated include viral bronchitis, streptococcal pharyngitis, uh, and HIV infection. Streptococcal pharyngitis is often associated most strongly with a primary onset of Gutate psoriasis in young children. Some additional environmental factors that can cause psoriatic flare-ups are drugs, including antimalarials, which can cause flare-ups up to two to three weeks post-treatment. Lithium, which aggravates psoriasis in 50% of patients, beta blockers, and corticosteroid withdrawal. Also climate, um, people with psoriasis uh, as a genetic predisposition tend to get outbreaks or symptomatic psoriasis more frequently in cold weather. Also alcohol use is associated with increased outbreaks due to the stress on the immune system that it causes. And here's just a quick diagram um, to kind of recap some of the triggers of psoriasis. And if you notice, they're all kind of related in one way in that they all trigger an immune response from the immune system of the person. And this immune system response then causes the symptomatic psoriasis. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the hypoproliferation um, in psoriasis. So first it is increased epidermal poiesis, specifically of the keratinocytes. Uh, these keratinocytes are located within the stratum corneum, which is the most superficial layer of your epidermis. Um, with people that have psoriasis, because of this hypoproliferation, it's actually said that they can have up to as many as 30 times more keratinocytes per unit of skin. With the cell cycle, you have a shortening in the duration of the actual keratinocyte cell cycle and then a doubling of the proliferation cell phase. One of the main things that hyperproliferation and psoriasis yields 
is the increased permeability of the capillaries, which you'll see in the picture. The dilated um, capillaries is expressed in the dark purple, and this is actually what causes the bright erythema that's seen in psoriasis patients. It's because of the increased um, blood flow and the vascular alterations. So the hyperproliferation in psoriasis psoriasis can actually be activated, like we've said earlier, by genetic or environmental factors, but also just an antigenic stimuli, which is anything that produces or activates an immune, an immune response. So once your immune response um, is activated, that usually results in the production of cytokines and white blood cells. So these cytokines then cause the attraction, activation, and differentiation of T cells. With this, then that leads to the more production of cytokines. So this is kind of like a positive feedback loop that's going on here, which then ends with epidermal hyperplasia and the accumulation of these inflammatory cells. Um, some of the kind of cytokines that are seen here can be um, interleukin-23 or interleukin-12 or tumor necrosis factor. And um, these productions of cytokines usually occur by the specific white blood cells of uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils. So now we are going to shift to the topic of acne. Acne uh, development occurs due to the following. One is the plugging of the folliculosebaceous unit. This is due to excess adhesion of keratinocytes and failure of the sloughing process. Another reason acne develops is because of sebum production. Sebum is the oily secretion from the sebaceous gland that is increased due to androgens. Without sebum production, uh, clogged follicles would fail to become more than comedones, which would not lead to acne. Overgrowth of P. acnes also causes acne development. The clogged follicle environment protecting the bacteria in addition to the sebum acting as a nutritional source, leads to bacterial overgrowth. And finally, secondary inflammatory response. Bacteria will signal for neutrophils, which leads to pustule formation. The follicular wall will rupture in response to the neutrophilic enzyme activity. This leads to increased inflammatory reactants to enter the dermis. The inflamed papule, pustule, or acne nodule will arise in response to lymphocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils. So we just finished going over the different steps that cause acne. Now we're going to go into the pathogenesis of acne, which is closely tied to what we just went over. So the different steps would be uh, the presence of hormones, which are androgens, sebaceous gland activity, activity of P. acnes, which leads to inflammation, and follicular hyperkeratinization. This leads to different comedones. So it's a combination of these four things that leads to acne. Also included a picture of a different clinical presentation of acne, including whiteheads, blackheads, open and closed comedones, papules, cysts, nodules, and pustules. The various acne treatments would include retinoids. Uh, an example would be vitamin A analogs. Antibiotics like benzoyl peroxide, clindamycin, erythromycin, and tetracycline, and anti-androgen medicines medications such as spiron spironolactone and oral contraceptives. The goal of this is to combat one or multiple areas of the four that we just went over for acne vulgaris. Retinoids is the first acne treatment we're going to go over. Uh, they inhibit androgen synthesis and they trigger, trigger cell cycle arrest and apoptosis and sebocytes. This in turn reduces sebum production. Uh, Retin-A or tretinoin uh, is effective against comedonal acne. Side effects include irritation, mild burning, redness, worsening, usually worsening within the initial two to four weeks, then getting better over time. Uh, an example of the low prescription would be that you would start it twice a week at bedtime and then build every night. Uh, Accutane is isotretinoin and it's effective against severe cystic acne. It has numerous side effects so you would not use this unless your acne is really severe. Uh, both of them are contraindicated indicated during pregnancy. Uh, because retinoids make your skin sensitive to the sun, it's recommended that you use them at night. Also you want to wear sunscreen during the day. 
Uh, start by applying every other night to avoid irritation and then build. Retinoids also can increase collagen production and plump fine lines, so it's good for wrinkles as well. Uh, a step do down from Retin-A would be Retinol. Uh, it's easier to tolerate, but it, it takes longer to take effect. In addition to retinoids, a common second line treatment are antibiotics, both in the topical and oral form. P. acnes works by producing enzymes that trigger inflammation and will contribute to the clogging of pores. So antibiotics work to suppress P. acnes by inhibiting protein synthesis. An example of a topical antibiotic is clindamycin, and that is used in conjunction with benzoyl peroxide gel, which is uh, the only substance that will actually reduce sebum production. Common side effects uh, to topical antibiotics, redness, burning, stinging sensation, dryness or peeling, and clinical testing in pregnant women has not been conducted with topical antibiotics, so it is just recommended that it not be used. Common oral antibiotics, uh, erythromycin, side effects, nausea, vom vomiting, upset stomach, diarrhea, uh, and yeast infections. A benefit of treating with erythromycin is that it is safe for pregnant or breastfeeding mothers as well as in children. Another common oral antibiotic, uh, the tetracycline family, also has similar side effects of nausea, vomiting, discoloration of teeth in patients younger than eight years old is also seen, and that is not safe to use during pregnancy. So antibiotics are generally used in conjunction with topical um, antibiotics as well. Another uh, oral treatment for acne are anti-androgen meds. So when topical retinoids and antibiotics uh, are not working, this is a third line of treatment that we will um, use, usually used for hormonally driven acne and the way to tell is the distribution of the acne will be mainly along the jawline, lower face, and neck, and usually will have a late onset, usually 25 years of age or older. Such an example is spironolactone. It is an androgen receptor inhibitor. It reduces sebum production. Side effects include excess urine production, hyperkalemia, irregular menstrual cycle, so you will see some irregular spotting, uh, breast tenderness, fatigue, and lightheadedness. Uh, labs are always checked to make sure that potassium levels are normal during the course of treatment. And the reason why you are going to see excess urine production, uh, spironolactone was actually a treatment for high blood pressure. Um, and has been used for many years and we discovered that it actually works better for acne. This medication is not safe to take during pregnancy and another anti-androgen medication obviously are oral contraceptives. Um, patients respond to these in many different ways and they work probably 50 percent of the time. It has been studied that uh, Oral contraceptives containing progestin are generally a little bit more effective than those containing estrogen, which does not seem to have a positive or negative effect on acne. Uh, such examples are Yaz, Yasmin, or ortho Orthocycline, and Trisprintec. And just some fun uh, common myths about acne. Uh, we've all heard that acne gets worse if you eat grease greasy or sw sweet foods. Um, that's generally not found to be true um, in studies. Uh, acne is caused by your face being dirty, so if you constantly wash your face, it will help treat acne. That is not true. It can actually aggravate your acne further. And then acne is due to a hormonal imbalance. That is not always the case. That's uh, the minority. And that concludes our presentation for the derm section.